The prospect of expanding my horizons in the glamorous world of New York City modeling was hard to resist. I had worked hard to build a reputation for professionalism, skill, and a strong work ethic. And I was determined to take my career to new heights in New York. It was time to test my skills in the biggest and most exciting modeling market in the world. Hello you guys, welcome back to my channel and if you are new then welcome. We are working our way through Melania Trump's book, Melania. And we are also doing other books at the same time. Sundays is Melania, Mondays is Vintage Magazine and Documentary Day, Wednesday is Chappaquiddick, a book all about the 1969 event that ended Mary Jo Kopechne's life and ended Ted Kennedy's chance at the White House. And then Fridays we are going through a book called Radium Girls. So please join us for any of those. And if you make it to the end of today's video and you haven't subscribed, I hope I can earn that subscription. Join me now. We're going to jump right in. And today we are learning about Melania Trump's fashion career. So I think this is going to be a really interesting episode. I know some people were really wary of having anything to do with Melania. And I get it. We all have you know, wariness when we approach politics, um, particularly if it's somebody that we feel unfamiliar with or even suspicious of. But this portion of her life is all pre-Trump. So even if you're not a Donald Trump fan, you could learn a little bit more about Melania through this episode. Let's get right into it. Chapter four, lights, camera, model. It started with a glamorous adventure, a train ride through the picturesque landscapes of Croatia and Serbia, headed toward the city of Belgrade, where my mother had invited me and my sister Inez to model her latest creations on the runway. The anticipation of stepping into the world of fashion at six years old filled me with excitement and joy. And what I wrote was, wow, that's young. <laughs> but I will say, as we go through the chapter, it does not sound like she harbors the same resentments that many like famous children who are thrust into the spotlight feel. And I think part of that is that she was not pushed into the limelight or pushed into fame by her mother. Her mother was actually a fashion designer and did this for a children's fashion company. And so she was used as a child model for her mother's work. It wasn't like her mother was a stage mom trying to promote her child's fame. Rather, Melania was excited to join in with what her mother was doing. So perhaps that's some of the reason why it was different. The venue was bustling with excitement as people gathered for the show. The runway was set up in the center of the hall with parents and children preparing backstage. My mother helped us get ready in our first outfits of the day before leading us to the runway. She whispered a few words of encouragement and then we were off gliding down the runway, showcasing our outfits. It was thrilling. So here we have her first time modeling on the runway. There she is. And then we get this one as well. she's here. After finishing my first round on the runway, I promptly headed backstage to change into the next outfit. The process repeated itself multiple times as I modeled raincoats, dresses, and blouses with a big smile on my face. I lost count of the outfits I wore that day, but the experience was truly enjoyable. So yeah, to me that sounds like Melania willingly entering in to her parents' work. I remember being um, in a totally different way. My dad um, worked at a vending company and I remember going to work with him and feeling very important when I got to participate in some of his job, you know, loading up the vending machine or grabbing the right box of chips to take on the truck or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think participating with our parents' work can be a really enjoyable experience that's quite distinct from childhood fame. As I matured, my focus shifted from modeling to creating. 
I was determined to push myself. My mother always emphasized the importance of curiosity and ambition in building a fulfilling life, one step at a time. Her sister Inez had started attending a design school in Ljubljana and admission was fiercely competitive. Only a few students were selected each year. Following in Inez's footsteps, I faced the challenging entrance exam two years after her. Passing the exam, I eagerly accepted my spot in the school and began making plans to move there for the upcoming school year. I chose a degree in industrial design, a field that combines art, fashion, graphic design, interior design, and production. The program required a blend of creativity, discipline, and structure. These aligned perfectly with my skills and goals. She's emphasized multiple times personal discipline, and we're going to see that reflected throughout this chapter. My parents had purchased an apartment in Ljubljana for Inez three years prior to provide her with a comfortable place to study and for our family to have a place to stay when we visited the city. I was excited at the prospect of living independently for the first time while also having the comfort of being with my sister. It was the perfect arrangement. Ljubljana was an exciting city full of energy and new impressions, fueling my growing sense of curiosity. She came in with a desire to learn and absorb as much as she could and found that school was demanding. It required Inez and I to dedicate a significant amount of time to our studies. So at this point, I am thinking that they are maybe 20 and 18. She says, we were only 15 and 17, but we were focused on shaping our futures. So, wow, I cannot imagine American parents doing this, purchasing an apartment in a city, maybe it's an hour or two, and leaving their 15 and 17 year old daughters to just study at a sort of university type course. This is pretty remarkable, I think. It's very different. It entrusted them with a lot of independence and autonomy and um, personal responsibility that is rather unique, I think. What do you think? Those of you who live around the world, does your culture permit this kind of independence at these ages? For Americans, does this seem totally different to you as it does to me? In 1987, a year after I relocated to Ljubljana, my mother invited me to accompany her to a fashion show she was attending. After the show, I took a moment to step outside and enjoy some fresh air. In the crisp January air of Slovenia, I stood in a white ensemble made by my mother. While I waited, a man approached me, introducing himself as Stain Jerko, a photographer. He proposed the idea of capturing some photographs. You're beautiful, he said. I think you'd make a great model. As a young teen, I couldn't help but feel a sense of doubt. I accepted the contact information, but felt unsure of his intentions. I had previously been photographed for children's clothing catalog and runway shows. However, I had never modeled for a professional photographer before. Given my academic obligations, having my pictures taken was not a priority for me at that time. Later, during a conversation with my sister, I mentioned the encounter, and Inez said that the photographer's name sounded familiar to her. We discovered he was well known for his work in Jana Magazine, Slovenia's premier lifestyle publication. The thought of collaborating with him was intriguing, but I didn't want to go alone. Let's go together, Inez said. And I just thought, this is actually showing wisdom and discernment for these two teens. It shows better judgment than many would have, even at ages 20 or older, that they would think, I don't know about his intentions. Let's find out more about him. Let's think this through. And then if we decide to go for it, we're gonna go together. <laughs> I think this shows a lot of wisdom. The studio was hardly glamorous. It was located in a modest Ljubljana building and lacked all of the amenities typically found at a photo shoot, like a makeup artist or a hairstylist. With just a photographer and a white backdrop, we were able to create strong images. The simplicity of the setup allowed for natural beauty to shine without the need for elaborate outfits, hair, or makeup. Oh y'all, I just saw a fly <laughs> it went by in the video. 
And I just have to say, we are swatting flies like mad right now. I don't know if y'all are. It's one of the seasons when we leave the windows open because it's so nice, but it does end up being a bit annoying to walk around with fly swatters all the time. I love the fall weather and I love having the windows open, but flies are like the bane of my existence right now. <laughs> After changing into a Jane Fonda style bodysuit I had brought with me and a pair of leg warmers, a popular look for the 1980s, I proceeded to try on a few dresses scattered around the studio. There were no shoes, so I remained barefoot for most of the photos. The photographer seemed pleased with our results and she shows us a few of these initial photos. Right here, this page is that set of photos very simple graphic but playing with shapes playing with body she was lovely obviously overcoming my initial uncertainty i trusted that he knew what he was doing the photo shoot was an unremarkable experience the lack of preparation and organization during the photo shoot was somewhat disappointing as a perfectionist i prefer things to be thoughtful and well-planned. Without professional assistance for hair and makeup, no designated outfits or a changing area, and a photographer snapping photos without any clear direction, my expectations were not very high. We see her personality coming through a lot, and some of you mentioned it in the last episode. I think you're going to see it even more in this one, that we start to see a very particular perspective and personality from Melania. And I do want to say, I'm kind of like teasing it a little bit, but I wondered like, is there a ghostwriter helping with this book or not? And throughout the next couple of episodes, I'm going to show you, I'm just going to every now and then point out a phrase or description that I think makes the case that there is no ghostwriter for this book, that we are actually getting Melania Trump's personal input and her writing. There are many reasons why I say this, but one would be that we're getting her personality. I think there's a very clear perspective here and it matches to me what we see from her public persona, that she's very reserved, but that she's very precise in what she presents to the world. So she says, I was not informed about the intended use of the photos or who they would be shared with. There was no formal agreement in place and no compensation. It appears though that the photos were circulated. I began receiving offers for modeling assignments. I noted that she's about 16 at this point. I signed with an agency which led to more significant bookings, including features in a Slovenian magazine and participation in runway shows. I was proud of my early success, but still saw modeling more as a hobby than a career. My primary focus was still my studies, and I had my mind set on becoming an architect. I took the rigorous entrance exam for the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Ljubljana and was accepted. So that's interesting. She sees this as kind of like, hey, I'm gonna do this thing on the side, it's gonna get me through school, but my real goal is to become an architect. Well, she meets an Italian movie producer who invites her to a modeling contest in Italy. The goal of this was to discover a new face for movies. And it was supposed to be a wonderful opportunity for new and upcoming talents. The winner would not only receive a generous prize, but secure a part in a movie. While I had never considered a film career, the competition seemed worth exploring. I arrived in Italy on a Wednesday in the middle of September, ready to take on the competition that awaited me. As I observed the other girls tirelessly practicing their runway walks, I felt a sense of calm confidence wash over me. I knew I was destined to do well. The competition was fierce, but I was ready to showcase my elegance and poise. As I watched the other contestants, I decided to simply be myself, believing that my authenticity would shine through. I chose to embrace my uniqueness and trust in my capabilities. This is the start of 
her, I think like self-confidence borderlining on pride coming through. You guys tell me, but I think we're going to see this kind of dotted throughout this chapter. This is the first place that I saw it where in the face of competition, I don't know your natural tendencies, but I think most of us, when we get into a room with lots of other people who are all going out for something, even when we feel like we merit being there, all of us, I, most of us, I believe, would have a deep gulp and nervousness as we enter that room and see other people. And yet she is like, well, I'm just going to be myself and I think I'll win them over. That's a unique level of self-confidence, I think. The pre-show interviews with the judges provide an opportunity to share background information about our lives, origins, interests, anything they wanted to share. And then it was time to demonstrate our talents on the runway. I felt self-assured in the elegant long black dress I had chosen for that occasion. As I walked the runway, the judges watched with keen eyes, scrutinizing my every move. The audience watched quietly and I strutted confidently in my high heels. And I won. The crowd erupted as I walked back onto the runway, holding a beautiful white poodle on a leash. The photographers snapped away, capturing the moment, and spectators shouted, Brava, bellissima, brava. As I stood there, I was elated. I had won first prize on the grand international stage. I was showered with gifts, a bouquet of flowers, a gleaming silver plaque, a stunning painting of the castle, and an envelope filled with my prize money. Let us capture this incredible moment, the photographers shouted. And so I handed everything over to an organizer for a quick photo op. However, when all of my belongings were returned, the envelope containing the prize money was conspicuously missing. She inquires about the money and everybody begs ignorance. She feels betrayed by the studio and feels like I trusted you with my belongings so I could take the photographs that you were wanting me to. And yet I get back all of it except for the money. The loss of the money itself was insignificant compared to the breach of trust that occurred. I returned home disappointed, not in the amount lost, but in the manner that it had been callously stolen from me. A week later, an organizer reached out, extending an invitation to return to Rome and collaborate. We would like for you to come back, he said, but my response was a resounding no. I had no desire to associate with individuals who would be so deceitful. Such dishonesty has no place in my life, and it never will. So, you know, I think some of you have said that the cover feels very ominous to you, I think not only is Melania a very classic, traditional type person, and so black and white probably feels very lovely and timeless to her, but I also think she has a very black and white nature. I think once she decides for or against someone, she is in or out. And I think this <laughs> these people were out. She decided, no way. I'll have nothing to do with you. Thank you very much. By 1992, at the age of 22, I was a dedicated architecture student and a successful part-time model. One day, Inez, who was a student at the Academy of Fine Art in Ljubljana, told me about a Slovenian modeling contest called The Look of the Year. The winner would secure a modeling contract with the Metropolitan Model Museum. <laughs> not MoMA in New York City, the Metropolitan Model Agency, a prestigious Paris-based agency. <laughs> Inez urged me to submit my photos. No one looks like you, she said. I had made a name for myself in the industry in front of audiences in Italy, and I had graced the runways, magazines, and catalogs of Slovenia, but I was wary of entering another competition. Nevertheless, she submits her photos and quickly receives an invitation to take part. She hears that there is buzz around one of her competitors and that competitor seems to have the right connections and everybody's talking about her. 
Despite the talk, I was determined to focus on my performance, maintain professionalism, and hopefully establish some valuable contacts during this event. My instincts were correct. The other model won first place, but I came in second and was offered a contract with RVR, a modeling agency in Milan. This unexpected opportunity forced me to make a decision between a career in architecture or modeling. She weighs this decision and thinks it through, believing that she'll be successful whichever way she goes, and decides to move to Milan. She says she was filled with anticipation, leaving behind her family and the architecture and design school that she had worked hard to be a part of was a significant step, but she felt ready for it. Moving to a new country, learning a new language and embarking on a new career were all very intimidating, but I was determined to succeed. The responsibility for my success now rested on my shoulders and I was prepared to take on the challenge with determination and perseverance. During my first few weeks, I quickly realized that I was solely responsible for navigating my way through this environment. I was on my own. She realizes she's alone in every form of transportation, when she goes on her walk to the next appointment, and the solitary life does not bother her. She enjoys a solitary life, and she finds it easy to rely on herself. I think we can kind of see why. She was raised in a very respectful family where she was encouraged to take on responsibility, and then she was released to a rather autonomous life at age 15. So it makes sense that by the time she's 22, she would really be ready to strike out. She finds that actually being alone clarifies her outlook. She starts to view it as a challenge, but also an opportunity, an opportunity for growth and an opportunity to pay attention to her inner self. She says she was determined to work as hard as possible to achieve her goals. With that look of the year contest, she had secured that contract with the agency in Milan, but soon it became clear to her that the contracts that they were offering were not the sort that she was interested in. Her aspirations were higher than what she was matched with. And so she made the bold decision to switch agencies. She gets a number from a fellow model of an agent that she wants to work with. His name is Ricardo Gay. She calls and asks for a meeting and gets it. When she arrives, the receptionist ushers her in to Ricardo's office. He greets her with a smile and offers her a seat. As I watched him silently leaf through the pages of my portfolio, I was aware that the photos were not the highest quality and the shoots that I had done were not from the most prestigious clients. After a few minutes, he closed the book and looked up at me. I would love to represent you in my agency, he said. He graciously introduces her to his colleagues and they welcome her in. They give her a tour of the headquarters and she's just elated, super excited. She says, sometimes in order to succeed, you must be willing to take risks and make tough decisions. You need to trust yourself and your abilities and never settle for anything less than what you deserve. This, I think, again, takes us back to the thesis that I proposed in the first chapter, which is that the message that she is trying to get across to us over and over again is trust yourself, trust your abilities, work hard for what you want, and go after what you want and just be disciplined to go after it. Again and again, that's the message that's at the root of whatever she's writing about. And here, this is the example that she's talking about is, this other agency wasn't really what I wanted. It wasn't giving me the kind of contracts that I wanted and I felt I deserved more, so I went after it. Soon, my schedule was filled with go -sees test photography, casting calls, and exciting photo shoots. From the cobblestone streets of Portofino for an editorial shoot to the historic beauty of Florence for an advertising campaign, 
to posing for a Japanese lingerie catalog in a Milan studio. The world of high fashion was now my playground and I was living out my dreams. I wish that they would have helped push her a little bit further. She does tell us about cobblestone streets and these different places, but she uses words like go sees and test photography. And for a person who's just reading a political memoir, those terms are quite specific. I happen to have watched America's Next Top Model. Maybe you did. I used to watch it back in the day when it was pretty new. Um, and I just found it kind of fascinating what the world of modeling even entailed. But a go-see is to go and with a with a group of models kind of be looked at to see like, is this somebody that we want for this particular ad or for this particular purpose? I think she tells us a lot of things, but she doesn't show us. And you know, years of going to writers groups, that is probably the number one thing that writers get told over and over again. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell, right? It means I don't just say, I made a video. I actually show the process of what it means to make a video, right? That if you're talking in a novel or if you're talking in an article, not to just describe it in the flattest terms possible, but to actually make it come alive. And I wish she would have done that. I really wanted to hear more specific. Let's hear some of it. Despite the glamorous aspects, such as exotic locations, beautiful clothes, and talented photographers, all models deal with frequent rejection. For every job secured by one model, hundreds of others are turned away. Sometimes the client would be looking for a blonde, sometimes a brunette, Sometimes you're too skinny. Sometimes you're too curvy. Sometimes, many times, there's no discernible reason at all. Your exterior is judged constantly. It's a brutal criticism that comes with being a model. To survive in the industry requires a high level of confidence, resilience, and determination. I was intent on never taking rejection personally. At the end of the day, if I didn't land a job, I understood that it had little to do with who I was as a person. I maintained a positive attitude and stayed dedicated to my craft. I focused on delivering high quality work. I made sure to be punctual, prepared, and professional. Models were often invited to parties and clubs by groups of men, promising work, money, connections, while others indulged in a lifestyle of excess, I stayed focused. I witnessed the harmful effects that drugs and excessive drinking had on young women, and I refused to be swayed from my path. I was singularly intent on my career goals. In hindsight, I am proud of weathering these challenges by staying true to myself and remaining focused. I was convinced I had made the right choices. Okay, so here I just wrote self-assurance. Again, let's give her her due. I think there is an element of pride here, but perhaps she saw so many models who got kind of off to the wayside because of bad decision-making in this area. And so, you know, she might, she might actually have some validity in feeling pride at walking that gauntlet, at making it through that pathway without having fallen prey to those vices. After two successful years in Milan, I decided to take on a new challenge and relocate to Paris. Paris was known for its competitiveness and high standards. It made it the perfect place for me to develop my career. Hot couture at every corner, prestigious clients waiting to be impressed. The competition was fierce, but the rewards were even greater. At that time, the modeling industry favored a very slim look, particularly on runways. As someone with a curvier physique, I focused my efforts on commercial modeling, catalogs, advertisements, and television commercials. By the mid-1990s, I had built a successful career in Europe. At the casting call in Milan, I met Paolo Zampoli, co-owner of Metropolitan Models in New York. He expressed interest in having me come to the U.S. And I found him to be straightforward and serious. These were qualities that I valued in a professional partner. The prospect of expanding my horizons in the glamorous world of New York City modeling was hard to resist. 
I had worked hard to build a reputation for professionalism, skill, and a strong work ethic. And I was determined to take my career to new heights in New York. It was time to test my skills in the biggest and most exciting modeling market in the world. So we went through her transition in chapter one, and we're about to move past that moment where she went through the immigration line. I found myself utterly enamored with the pulse of New York City. It resonated from the very beginning, the fast tempo and the positive energy. Each corner revealed a new side of New York's multifaceted personality, from chic boutiques to busy streets. While I occasionally yearned for the refined charm of European cities, there was a raw, modern elegance in New York's towering skyscrapers and sleek architecture that captivated me. After securing my work visa, my professionalism and punctuality won over clients, leading to bookings with prestigious department stores like Bergdorf Goodman, Neiman Marcus, and editorial shoots for magazines such as Fitness and Glamour. Embracing my maturity and refined look, I secured steady work, navigating the competitive modeling industry with grace. So this is actually the second example I wanna share with you, where the first one, I wanted to hear more about the actual dynamics of what happens on a photo shoot. I wish she would have shared more with all of the experience. I think she's needing to move through it, but I would have loved for her to share with us, like, what does it actually look at? How long does it take to sit for makeup or hair? Or was there a particular part she hated or loved? This is another part where she talks about maturity. And this is a unique perspective that we're being privy to because she's 26 when she moves to New York City. 26 is old for a model. And that's what she means when she says, embracing my maturity and refined look. She's not a 14 year old, you know, heroin addict, which was the perspective back in the nineties when that thin look was popular, that it was almost like a boy body was popular, um, you know, very thin, no curves and all of it. And she's curvy and she's 26. I think she could have given us a little more about what it was like to find the right match for her body set in that environment. She gives us a little. I just wish she would have given us more so we could understand because this is a significant length of time in her life. She says, after a few months of renting a room that the agency provided me, I found myself a one bedroom on the third floor of a historic brownstone building near 30th and Park Avenue, a place of my own. It was charming and bright with simple moldings and brown wooden floors. When she said a place of my own, I just thought this is part of who she is. She loves solitude. She really loves quiet refinement. And I think we're gonna see this continually as we move forward, but we see it here very clear. There was a view of the courtyard and a big tree in the middle of it. I loved the touch of nature in the middle of the concrete jungle. The agency was in Union Square and the go-sees and studios were often downtown. So living in Midtown meant I could walk almost everywhere. I always made time to enjoy the city's cultural gems, MoMA, the Guggenheim, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Visiting museums is a habit I've maintained in every city I've been in. They bring me joy and inspiration. And that makes sense, given that she has a background in art and architecture and design, that she would have an interest in those things and have built up a habit of enjoying those things probably during that 15 to 22 year old period in her life. Similarly, my husband was an art major in college. And so we built up that habit together when we were dating, engaged, and then newly married. And so even still going to museums is something that we really love as a family. I really could relate that she developed that habit in those pivotal years of influence when you're becoming an adult, because we did too. New York was a vibrant and sophisticated playground. Memorable dinners with friends were a social highlight. 
Living and working in New York was an exhilarating experience with constant opportunities. The fast pace kept me motivated as I booked jobs, shot campaigns, and sought new projects. Modeling was far from a nine to five job and my schedule was packed, but the thrill of being in demand and on the move was energizing. I traveled to Europe for prestigious shoots and then to San Francisco for Macy's, to Miami for Elle Canada, and I made my mark in the industry. Rejections did not deter me. They only fueled my desire to excel. My life at that time was not perfect, but filled with moments of success and achievement. Although I had faced rejections, I remained dedicated and focused on my goals. I took risks fearlessly, guided by my youthful courage. In hindsight, this boldness paved the way for my triumphs. I just thought, you know, that that reminds me of that saying, fortune favors the bold. And you know, there's times when a bold decision lands you on your face. <laughs> She's had a number of bold decisions going into that guy's agency and asking him to represent her when she already had a different agency representing her, moving to New York City, where each of those propelled her to a new height in her career. But that's not always the way it goes. I think she had a uniquely successful um, time of taking risks. And, you know, it's possible too that by her family or by her own experience, she had a good judge of what a good risk was. You know, maybe we don't all have the same sense of judgment in that, but she seemed to take risks in a way that was calculated and achievable. And she did it. What I accomplished in that first year felt extraordinary. I was now living confidently in a foreign land, independent, self-reliant. While I could have settled for a comfortable career in Slovenia, Milan, or Paris, my inner voice urged me to strive for more. My journey to New York was a testament to my firm determination, courage, and resilience. Y'all, this <laughs> sentence, I don't know if you guys are feeling it at this point, but I actually, it reminded me of something. I hope my husband won't mind me mentioning this. It's such a joke between us. We were going through old boxes and we found a project of his like from second grade where he had written a story and it was like kind of like a take on the country mouse and city mouse story, but he had adapted it like a lot of elementary school students do to adapt a story. But it was it's in that old dot matrix printer um, font that we all used back in the 80s or early 90s. And it says, um, I dedicate this project to all of my very, very, very hard work. <laughs> and we just laugh like, wow, you were really self-impressed. You really thought you had done an awesome job. you second grade you, you know. This actually reminds me of that. My journey to New York was a testament to my firm determination, courage, and resilience. <laughs> it just reminds me of, I dedicate this project to my very, very, very hard work. <laughs> and I do want to say, I feel like this is all wearing a bit thin at this point. It felt a little bit like she had flipped through the thesaurus and like she's just coming up with more words that mean hard work, determination, resilience, perseverance. We get it. We get it. And I think she should have let an editor take more of a red pen to these pages. This right here is some of why I really don't believe this was written by a ghostwriter. Because like I said, I've for about five years consistently, I've attended a writer's group here in Dallas, but over about 10 or 15 years, I've been a part of writer's groups, writer's forums, you know, followed different um, conferences and that kind of thing. And I don't know of a ghost writer, even on a fairly low tier level, that would allow this to be printed. 
And what I think is happening is that English is her second language and she's trying to communicate something very important to her, which is I was working hard. I was not out there, you know, getting high, lazing around, not working, just trying to go on my beauty. I was someone who was working really hard, enjoying my off time, but taking the opportunities I could and even taking bold steps to advance my career when necessary. I think that's what she's trying to communicate here, but it does feel a bit like a thesaurus attack. And I just wanted her to show us a little bit more of her hard work rather than telling us. And I wish that it didn't use every possible synonym. That's what I wish. I found myself wanting more at the end of this chapter, more of like what it's like to be her physically in this place. She gives us a little bit of that. I just wanted a little bit more. And if you're feeling that, you know, maybe we're together on that. To wrap up this chapter, she says, through it all, I was blessed with the steady support and encouragement of my parents and sister back home. While it was challenging to stay connected in the mid nineties, and it was, we managed to keep in touch through phone calls. There was no FaceTime, there was no Skype, there was no internet, there was not emailing, there was not Blackberries, there was not you know, texting, um, there was nothing. You often had to schedule phone calls and it would be you know, pretty expensive and remembering the time difference and all of it would have been complex, especially with a sister in one city and parents in a different city. So I don't doubt that it was difficult and yet they did manage to stay connected and bravo to them, that's huge. She says her parents' pride in what she was doing was motivating to her. And then one day as she was walking out in Midtown, I looked up and caught sight of my larger than life image on a billboard in Times Square. In that moment, a surge of pride washed over me, knowing that my work had paid off in the most rewarding way. That really would be fulfilling to achieve so much in a little more than a year in New York that, you know, she had gone from being a Slovenian catalog type model with some runway and an occasional Italian show. Then she goes to Milan. She levels up in her agency. Then she goes to Paris. And then someone basically recruits her to go to New York City. And now in a little more than a year, she's on a huge billboard in Times Square. I mean, that would feel <laughs> really amazing. And I do want to say someone commented in, in the last video that they felt it kind of hollow or vacuous that she cares about appearance, that she cares about, you know, the outside appearance. And I want to say through this chapter, we actually learned that's not all that she is. And that's not all that she cared about. She cared about hard work and she did for a while work very hard at architecture and industrial design, but that she took the opportunities that presented themselves to her. And I think we all have to do that. You know, I, I think I shared in one of my videos, or at least in the comments section, I started out as a vocal performance major. I loved to sing, but that wasn't actually what opportunities presented themselves to me at the appropriate time when I was making career decisions. And so my hard work paid off in one arena rather than the one that I thought I was gonna go into. And that's the same for her and probably for many of you. And so I don't think her being known for fashion or interested in it in a very perfectionistic way which reflects her personality is vacuous at all. I think it's her bringing her whole self for perfection, for professionalism and doing things in an orderly way, right? Those are all the things we've heard expressed from her, even from a young age. So that she brings those to the fashion world, isn't that surprising? What do you think? Do you agree, disagree? I don't view it as vacuous. I view it as just part of her personality that she's bringing to the table. So that's Melania chapter four. Next time we are getting into a chapter. I'm telling y'all it's good. It's interesting. And I'm going to be here for it. Starts out chapter five. Hi, I'm Donald Trump. 
So we're going to hear about their meeting and we are only going to do half of that chapter to get through those parts because it's a long chapter. And so we're going to look at their courtship in chapter five. That'll be our next episode. I hope you'll be back for it. And if you made it this far and you're still interested, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thank you guys so much and we'll see you soon. Bye.